We are continuing our study verse by verse through the book of Genesis. And um, as you can see there, we're not going to quite get through two chapters just because there's a lot in this chapter and a half that we're going through. And uh, we're going to end at a good stopping point here. And Anyway, chapter breaks aren't inspired. Let's put it that way, right? And so uh, we're going to cut it halfway through chapter 30 tonight. But hopefully you'll have your Bible open to Genesis 29. Uh, because it's so much easier to follow along when you've got your Bible open and you can just make sure that what I'm reading is what's actually on the page. And so as you turn there, let's pray one more time. Father, I thank you for tonight. Thank you for bringing us here. And I thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for those who came before us. I pray, Lord, as we so often pray, uh, that we would learn the easy way and not the hard way, that we would humble ourselves before you now and lean upon your understanding, not our own. Lean upon you. Follow you, follow your leading, follow your ways. Thank you, Lord, for instructing us and teaching us, and we pray you would do so again tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, weddings can be super fun. Um, Obviously, I get to go to a lot of them. As most brides and, of course, uh, brides' mothers know, weddings can also be super stressful. And... um, I found just a, a few things here. By the way, the youth are meeting in the, the back over here. Um, that that kind of describe the stress. Smile and pretend that the last six months of your life haven't been stressing you to the point that you've had several breakdowns on the bathroom floor. Um, maybe you've uh, been in a place where you can relate to that. You know, planning my wedding was really easy and stress-free. said, no bride ever. And uh, if I cry at our wedding, it's just because I'll be overjoyed that the planning is finally over which is uh, true in a lot of cases. You know, pastors aren't exempt from this. Anything can happen in a wedding (laughs) ceremony. I I remember one not too long ago that I did, and you had kids just running all over the place up front. I had no idea how to control it, how not to. I like what Tom Rainier, he related the story, saying that the uncle of a bride sent in a request that because he couldn't attend the ceremony, and he asked someone to read 1 John 4.18 which says there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love casts out fear. Instead, what was actually read was John 4, 18 at the wedding, which says you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. (laughs) Certain surprises can be fun at weddings, right? Not all weddings are expected. Uh, Some come out as, as a surprise, and sometimes after the wedding night, the surprises keep on coming. That was a case with Jacob and his family. Because of some trickery on the part of his father-in-law and the favoritism that Jacob showed on his own account, Jacob not only had a surprise on his wedding night, but he and everybody else had a lot of surprises and a lot of heartache in the days that followed. Now, the good news is that even though so much of this heartache was due to sin, God is sovereign. God is sovereign even over our sin. He can take the things that people mean for evil. He can take our shortcomings, our mistakes, even our sinful shortcuts. And from those things, God can bring great good. And that's exactly what God did with Jacob. Now, we've got to remember, Jacob did not arrive on this scene completely innocent, spotless, and blameless, right? The reason he had been sent so far away to find a bride from his Uncle Laban was due to Jacob's and his mother's own scheming and deception. A not-so-friendly rivalry had long existed between him and his twin brother Esau, primarily over the covenant blessing that Jacob had been prophesied to receive, but Jacob, as the older brother, really desired to keep for himself. Esau and his dad and Jacob's dad Isaac had together conspired to try to find a way around the prophecy, saying that the covenant would go to Jacob. And uh, Jacob and his mom, Rebecca, responded with a conspiracy of their own. And together, you might recall, they worked to deceive the nearly blind Isaac, manipulating him to believe that Jacob, who was in disguise, was really Esau. And he received the fatherly blessing that Isaac intended to give to the older son. Now, upon realizing the truth, Isaac also recognized that the blessing rightfully belonged to Jacob. But now Esau... The brother desired to kill him. So this is why Isaac sent Jacob to the region of Haran and Syria to find Rebekah's family in order that Jacob might take a wife. 
Now, once on the road with the full knowledgeable blessing of his father, Jacob, you might recall from last week, had a vision from God. He saw a ladder leading to heaven, received God's own assurance that God would never leave Jacob. God would fulfill all the covenant promises that he made to him. We would think this would be a wonderful thing to respond to in faith. Well, Jacob began a road of faith and a walk of faith, but he doesn't quite get there. He gives God a conditional promise of his worship once God eventually brings him back, if God brought him back to the promised land. Now, obviously, he had a lot to learn. And we're going to find over the next couple weeks that Jacob receives a lot of these lessons the hard way with his uncle Laban. Now, Genesis 29 and 30 introduced Jacob to the family that he's going to have there. It shows his marriages, shows his ensuing children. And we're going to see that it doesn't happen without a lot of stress along the way. And this man who had so often deceived his own family was himself the victim of deception. The man who knew what it was like to suffer unjust favoritism, sibling rivalry, himself showed favoritism, caused sibling rivalry. And it led to a lot of pain. But again, the good news, God is sovereign over it all. God still worked his plan. He continued to lay the foundation for the Messiah, for Jesus. Praise God he's sovereign over our stress. He's sovereign over our sin. We can trust him no matter what. So we start with Genesis 29. Jacob finds the family of Laban. It says in verse 1, So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east, and he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, put the stone back in his place on the well's mouth. So uh, he arrived in Haran, and just by uh, recollection, you may recall, he was down here, really. Last we saw him, he was in Bethel. That's where he received the vision. He comes all the way up to Syria and Haran. Um, Bethel, of course, in the Promised Land. Long way between there and Syria, several hundred miles, and the narrative just skips over it all. Um, that wasn't the important thing is the travel. The, tr- the important thing was what happened when he got there. Now, when he arrived, he came to a well, which ought to sound very familiar as we've been studying through the book of Genesis because it happened in Genesis 24. You remember then Abraham's servant had gone to the same area to find a bride for Isaac. And when he arrived in Haran, he also arrived at a well. So was this the same well that Abraham's servant had met Rebecca? Well, perhaps don't know that for sure because back in Genesis 24, that well is not described as having a stone covering, a stone lid. But in any case, it's, it's obvious that God was guiding Jacob just as God had guided Abraham's servant, even if it's not specifically credited here in the text as God is having done so. By the way, why the stone lid? Well, it's probably to keep out dirt and animals from going into the well. And obviously, it will have it explained here as well. Easier to remove it once and water all the animals than to have to keep removing this heavy stone lid throughout the day. And it'll explain that again here, verse 4. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. So he said to them, Is he well? They said, He is well. And, And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. So obvious confirmation of success God led Jacob to exactly the right spot, exactly the right people. He's in the right city. He met the people who could lead him to his family. And he's even there exactly at the right time as one of his family members approaches him. And again, this is nothing less than a miracle of God. This is exactly what had happened with the previous generation. And what we're going to find here in chapter 29 is several parallels to earlier events in the Abrahamic family in Genesis, right? Jacob retraces a lot of steps here. Some are very good. You see God's provision and God's miracles. Some are kind of bad as well because he continues in um, some of the, the mistakes previous people had made before. At this stage, it's good. And at this stage, this really should have primed the pump of Jacob's memory of all the stories that he'd heard in the past. Obviously, uh, he didn't have the formal book of Genesis, but he had the actual people to hear it from. And so he would have known what have happened with his mother and father and the servant that brought his mother back from Haran. And if he had remembered how Abraham's servant had found Jacob's mother, he might find similar success himself. You can imagine him getting more excited by the moment here. Verse 7, then he said, look, it is still high day. 
It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. They have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. You know, he sees Rebecca coming, and it seems like he's already trying to push and have some provision, have water ready for Rachel, ready to go. But townspeople aren't willing to budge. That's your problem. We're going to wait till everybody's gathered according to our normal schedule. And that's when Jacob takes personal action. You've got to love this, verse 9. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. That was a big show of strength. Rippling muscles of the guy from the promised land, right? Jacob moved this stone himself. Now, this was a large stone, it said in verse 2, and it was likely that several man, men usually teamed up together to, to remove it. And now, you know, Jacob's so excited about his opportunity to, to meet Laban's family, he can't wait to show off a little bit. He's, he's Rebecca, and he's willing to go through great difficulties in order to, to serve her. Now, it, it's going to be later on that the love between Jacob and Rachel is actually mentioned and described. But please note at this point, the emphasis isn't necessarily on Rachel, it's on Laban. His mother's brother, his mother's brother, said three times there, right? God had blessed Jacob, took him exactly to the right family, and that family connection here is what's being stressed in this story. God is the one who had given success. God was sovereign over Jacob to this point. God's already proving himself true from the things that he mentioned in chapter 28. Would Jacob be smart enough to recognize it, right? Verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel, lifted up his voice, and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Now, this is probably not a romantic kiss, probably not yet, at least. You know, and this is what they did in that culture. They kissed each other upon greeting. So it's an overjoyed greeting. And apparently there's so much shared excitement that Rachel runs to go tell her dad, which makes you think she just kind of left Jacob hanging at the well. <laughs> What's going to go on in the city square? Her dad has to run back to go get Jacob. Right, Verse 13, came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. So Laban received Jacob with the same greeting that Jacob had given Rachel. Now, for as much as it sounded familiar to Jacob, Laban's probably noticing some differences by this point. When Abraham's servant arrived, he came with great wealth and he gave nose rings and all kinds of gifts to people. Uh, Jacob, uh, you know, had a lot of wealth back in the promised land, but apparently he didn't bring anything with him. And so Laban seems like he's almost got to be convinced that, that this is really his family because it's a lot different than what it went before. But apparently, surely you are my bone and flesh, verse 14. He was convinced at some point. Also note this, he stayed much longer than Abraham's servant. Back in 24, you might remember, Genesis 24, the servant arrived in town. He refused even to eat dinner before he was able to tell his business that he was there for one purpose, one purpose only. He was going to get a wife for his master's son. And once the, the arrangement for the marriage is made, he leaves when? The very next morning, even though they wanted him to stay near a month, no, he's going to leave the next day. Now, in all likelihood, this is what Rebecca, back in the promised land, Jacob's mom, this is what she imagined Jacob doing as well. You might recall that when she came up with the idea to send him away, she was just thinking Esau was going to be mad for a few days. Hey, he sent him on a, a few weeks journey trip. He's there, he's back, and we're back together again. As it turns out, Jacob lingered with Laban. He did not arrive with the gold. He didn't arrive with the gifts as his grandfather's servant had done. And so he probably thought he needed to prove himself in the eyes of his uncle, right? Lay down some groundwork. So that's why he was there for a month before he says anything at all. And this is when we start moving to marriage here in verse 15. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? So Laban understood there's something going on. There's a reason why he's hanging around so long. He hadn't said why he was there yet. 
there's got to be a catch here somewhere. Jacob wanted something, just come out and say it. By the way, before we go on from this point, um, really good principle just in general here. A wor worker is worthy of his wages, 1 Timothy 5.18. Now, Laban could have, since Jacob was a nephew, could have taken advantage of him and got all kinds of free labor for as long as he wanted. But he didn't want to take advantage of that relationship, but at least he doesn't say so here. And just because we have a good relationship with somebody, and this is a, a, a pet peeve of mine, just because a, a contractor for hire might be a born-again Christian, doesn't mean that they don't deserve adequate compensation from us. Right? We want to pay somebody. The worker is worthy of his wage, and that's exactly what Laban does here. And at this point, Laban seems to be an honest man. Now, just wait. Things are going to change. But at least that part from Laban is good, verse 16. Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel, or Rachel, actually. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. So we're introduced to both of his daughters. There's an immediate comparison. Leah is said to have delicate eyes, but the meaning of the term is really unclear. And the Hebrew word, depending on the context, could be translated tender, weak, faint, or even fair. The point, though, delicate doesn't necessarily equal ugly. The interpretation possibilities really do range from a compliment to a complaint. So that's not clear. But what is clear is the comparison that's set up between the two sisters. Even if the term delicate was a compliment, she had fair eyes, then that's the very best thing that could be said about Leah as opposed to Rachel, who is apparently strikingly beautiful, beautiful form and appearance just, just all over. So there is a comparison there being made. By the way, the details here regarding their appearance, that's not a comment by the biblical text on their value. It's just a record which probably played into Jacob's own desire for them. Now that's sad enough on its own. Physical beauty, of course, is something that can be appreciated, but we know it's not the end-all be-all for value. How do we know that? Well, if nothing else, we look to Jesus. Jesus had no physical beauty, had nothing about him physically that men would desire him, according to Isaiah 53 too, but he's to be desired above all. He's the, the best in all the world. Verse 18. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. Remember, Jacob arrived in Haran penniless, but he came for the specific purpose of acquiring a wife. So how do you get a wife without a dowry payment? Well, he offered seven years of field work as a livestock hand. That's worth quite a bit of money. And if Laban's willing to negotiate this deal, that's going to be pretty profitable to him. And so obviously he agreed to the terms, said it was better to do this. Uh, literally, it was good to do this, good to give her to Jacob. Um, we might read the words from a 21st century Western perspective and think it's, well, I might as well do this with you. It's better than, you know, letting her rot or anything like that. You know, it's not a second best. This He agrees this is a really good deal for him. This is, uh, this is not just to the side. This is desirable. And please note, though, when Jacob negotiates his dowry price, he does so with very specific terms. He requested whom? Rachel, your younger daughter. Now, this is something that Laban conveniently forgets or most likely ignores over the course of seven years, because we're going to see that change very quickly. Verse 20, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. you got to love uh, when you have accounts here of true love. You know, time just flew by, and the time spent in the fields, that was nothing compared to the time he would spend with his bride-to-be, or at least so he thought. And this is when it gets really interesting now. Verse 21, Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. Now his time's up, seven years have gone by, and apparently jo uh, uh, um, Jacob had to prompt Laban to fulfill his end of the bargain. All right, seven years have gone by, it's time for me to get married. I need your daughter. Now at first glance, everything appears normal. He sets up a feast, he invites the, the, the public. This is traditional cultural things that would take place at a wedding. 
things appeared normal on the outside, but during the course of the night, things became very clear. They were not normal. Laban engaged in private deception. He took Leah, the older, not Rachel, the younger. Verse 25, so it came to pass in the morning that, behold, he discovered it, it's Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it is not to be done so in our cult country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service with which you will serve me still another seven years. Now we ask the question, why didn't Jacob know earlier? When we go to weddings in our culture today, it's very, very clear who's getting married to whom. Even when they're wearing a veil, that veil doesn't really veil anything at all, right? You want to see the bride, and, and that's very, very open. Answer is that the cultures that had the weddings at that time in that culture, I should say, were very, very different. Between the darkness, the drunkenness, because remember there's a feast, and the veil, which was very, very different, a very heavy covered veil. You imagine Middle Eastern countries today still wear this sort of very thick veil. Well, Jacob wasn't aware of the reality of what was going on until dawn's first light. Could have brought in any woman at all to him. He wouldn't have known exactly what was going on until he could see the things in the morning. What we see going on here is another parallel to the past. The first parallel is that they uh, saw God miraculously bring him to Haran. The second parallel, though, is that Jacob was deceived by Laban in much of the same way as Jacob had deceived his father. Isaac had been tricked by a disguised Jacob. Jacob was tricked by a disguised Leah. Of course, per the command of her father, she's just being obedient. It's been often said, what comes around goes around. That's definitely the true in Jacob's case. By the way, was the idea of marrying off the older daughter a true tradition to have her married first in that culture? That's actually unknown, and you've got different scholars that have different takes on that. It's possible, but it's also just as possible, if not probable, that this was an invention of Laban to justify his unscrupulous actions. Whatever the case, though, with the tradition, this was definitely advantageous to Laban because he didn't just get seven years free labor. Now he got 14 years of free labor total. Uh, he, he was a shrewd businessman. Verse 28, Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And so he gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife also. And Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter as Rachel as maid. So Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. By the way, the week was the wedding feast week. He went in and, and, and uh, had the wedding, of course, with Leah that night. Then seven days passed by before he was given a, a second wife. He didn't have to wait another seven years before he was wed to the woman he initially desired. No, just seven days, and then he's married a second time. Now, Jacob was deceived, but notice here, Jacob at least is now being faithful to his promise. He does not try, as you might expect the heel catcher to have done in the past, he does not try to weasel his way out of still another seven years. No, he serves it as he was expected to do. And perhaps we see here Jacob continuing on his walk of faith. And he recognizes that all the things that he was experiencing had been allowed by God and perhaps even thought of this as being a bit of divine retribution. Again, he had been deceptive towards his father, and now his father-in-law is being deceptive towards him. What comes around goes around, as we said, you know, uh, the Bible actually addresses this concept straight out. We read Paul writing to the Galatians, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Again, it's called divine retribution or the principle of sowing and reaping. Please note, this is not the Eastern idea of karma. Please, Christians, do not use the word karma to describe this. That is an unbiblical term. This is the biblical idea of justice. Justice. God is not going to be fooled by our actions. He's not going to be fooled by our attitudes. If we deceive, we're going to have to expect deception. If we gossip, we're going to have to expect to be gossiped about. But the good news is that the reverse is also true. If we do things for the glory of God, we love others. 
If we show compassion, we can expect the same. The things that we sow are the things that we reap. Uh, sometimes we put it another way, the, the dogs that's strongest is the dog that you're feeding. Right? What are you feeding in your life? What are you sowing in your life? Well, a lot of times you can find out what you're sowing by the things that you're reaping. I'm reaping all kinds of things that I don't think are godly. I'm reaping all this sin. Well, that means you were sowing it to begin with. Start sowing the good things. And you can start reaping the good things as well. Okay, so moves from marriage to sibling rivalry, really of the worst kind, starting here in verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now, Jacob had been faithful to his promise. He was staying there, and he stayed married to her. But notice he's showing favoritism among his wives. Leah, it says here, was unloved. And literally, the word says Leah was hated. She was hated. Now, granted, the word can be used as a simple comparison, but there is little doubt at all that this was exactly the way Leah felt. She felt as if she was truly hated by her husband. And, and you've got to put her, yourself in her shoes for a minute. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the pain that went with that? Here you are married off. He, you weren't wanted to begin with. You know, you're like the last kid picked on the, the soccer team. I was always the last kid picked at kickball. I hated that. I was always on the sidelines. So, but that's what they did there. You're the last one picked, and you're not the one desired. You're just kind of put up with. She's got to live with this all her life. She felt truly hated. And again, this is another parallel. Just as there were favoritism between Esau and Jacob and competition for the attention of their parents. Remember, Esau was even trying to marry whoever it would be that would please his parents. Now there's favoritism shown by Jacob to his wives and begins this terrible competition between the two sisters for the attention of their common husband. And by the way, this provides a great example of why polygamy is never never endorsed by God. Now, he does allow it at certain points throughout biblical history, <laughs> prominently here, but God never once commends it as being something good or desirable. From Genesis chapter 1 and 2 onwards, God in, God's intent for marriage has always been from one man, in addition to one woman, for life, together in submission to him, submission to one another. That is God's plan for marriage. When we veer from that, we get into trouble. And that's exactly what we're going to see here in the next several verses. Right? Now, Leah isn't alone in all of this. She was hated by her husband, but God, it says, saw her. God knew her grief, and God acted. God opened the womb of Leah while allowing Rachel to remain barren. Now, we're going to address Rachel's situation in a moment. But please take note of the grace that God gave Leah. God ensured that Leah would be fruitful in her pregnancies, knowing that she didn't have a husband who loved her. And because of that, well, she would have many sons who did. God knew exactly what Leah needed, and he provided for her. And we sang about it today. God sees us. God knows our griefs. God knows our pains. He knows exactly the right answer for those things. So we want to trust him with our griefs. Verse 32, So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Now, we're going to find that all the names of the sons of Jacob come with meaning. That's very common in the day. Uh, a lot of times the etymology isn't necessarily historical or grammatical. Sometimes it's um, just wordplay or they sound similar. Um, here, though, the, the name was literal, Reuben. Um, means behold or, or look, a son. Not from the perspective of surprise, like look what popped out today. <laughs> but this was proof, right? Look, I have borne you a son is the idea. Leah sadly believed that she could earn the love of her husband. Obviously, her situation isn't her fault. But obviously, again, Jacob's attention is not going to be able to be bought just by children here. Verse 33, then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, therefore he has given me the son also. And she called his name Simeon. Now here this involves a little bit of wordplay. God heard the plight of Leah, the Hebrew word for here being Shema. We hear the word Shema when we talk about uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the Hebrew Shema. Well, Simeon, uh, Shemion, right, has related sound related meaning, right? Basically, God hears. 
Notice, too, in these first two sons, Leah directly credits Yahweh God using his covenant name. For all of her trouble, she at least understands the source of her children. Leah, at this point, shows that she has at least some faith in Almighty God. Great reminder, where do we turn to in our troubles? No one else except the covenant Almighty God. He is our only hope. And that's all Leah had at this point. Verse 34, she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. Etymology here is a little bit looser. Uh, Levi is similar to the word for attached. Uh, Leva is the word to attach. So Levi, Levi, could be translated joined or attached to me. And so she's thinking that, you know, having her children or her ability to continue bearing children is the thing that's going to make her love and going to make her husband cling to her now for the first time, make her valuable in the eyes of her husband. Obviously, it's not going to work. Verse 35, and she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. And then she stopped bearing. Now, finally, she got a right perspective. At this point, she understands it doesn't matter what her uncaring husband did. Leah knew what she would do, and she would praise the Lord. And the word Judah does mean praise. Yada, uh, to praise. Yehuda uh, is basically the uh, grammatical form of that. So whatever we do, we are to do it unto the praise of God. And that's what she finds here. In all of her troubles and all of her struggles and all of her trials with her husband, she is going to praise the Lord. We praise the Lord at all time and as our hope is in him. I love what the psalmist says towards the end of the book, Psalm 146, 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, literally in the Hebrew. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. When his spirit departs, he returns to the earth. And that day, very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now, Jacob was not being very much help to lay at this point, but the God of Jacob was. And her hope did not need to be in man or the son of man, uh, you know, that would pass away or wasn't helping, wasn't paying attention to her. Her hope was in God and she could praise the Lord. Whom is it do you trust? Whom is it do you praise? Whom is it do you think that it's actually going to be the one to provide for you? It needs to be the Lord God because everyone else is going to disappoint. That is a fact. But when our trust is in the Lord, that means we can always praise the Lord. By the way, before we leave this, please notice that the priestly tribe of Levi, the kingly and the messianic tribe of Judah, both came from whom? Leah, not Rachel. The wife Jacob never intended to have, never truly valued, never truly loved, was God's intent for Jacob all along. And again, this is a sovereignty of God at work. This was not jacob's choice for himself this was god's choice for jacob and it came about through the act of a deception but god still used that to bring about our salvation our god is sovereign over all things so she stopped bearing at least we should say stop bearing for now more children's going to come in the future so you might say the first wave is done now her fertility is contrasted with that of her younger sister, starting in chapter 30, verse 1. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who's withheld from you the fruit of your womb? So envy leads to anger. Anger leads to exaggeration, leads to blame. She lashes out at her husband. You know, the one who actually did love her, she had something that Leah did not and desired to have and ached for, but she didn't appreciate that. She blames him for all of her problems. Now, Jacob isn't blameless in his response back. Now, he's truthful, but he's hurtful at the same time. He speaks in anger, right? It actually says anger was aroused against Rachel. There's a lot more tender ways of stating this truth to her. And truth and love is far better than what he does here. Now, theologically speaking, we might ask the question, why does God allow some women to be childless? 
we can't answer every question. We can know a few answers from the Bible. Number one, we live in a fallen world, and our bodies have fallen with the rest of creation. And originally, we acknowledge that God created all males and females to reproduce. That's true among humans. That's true among animals. Be fruitful and multiply was the command given. Not all can due to the physical corruption of the flesh. Right? So that's one possibility. Second thing we need to acknowledge from the Bible is that God is indeed the author of life. And so all life comes from him and his will. All children are a blessing, but most importantly, a gift from the Lord. Because there's no other source from whence they can come. Which has all sorts of ramifications today when it comes to things like abortion. Because we did not author that life. God does. We don't have the right to take it away. Third thing, biblically, we can say is that God has his own reasons for his actions. We don't always know what those are, but we can trust God does have his reasons. Sometimes it's his perfect timing at work. He's just waiting for the right time. Other times he might, for whatever reason, never give children. He has his own hidden will as to why some couples never have children. And Christians, we need to be very careful how we relate to to people who are suffering through something such as that, because that can be very, very painful and something that should never be minimalized, never be trivialized. Well, it's just better for you if, well, we don't know the situations for all these things. But even so, that particular hardship can be and should be dealt with in the same way as other trials and hardship, through humble faith, through trust in the Lord Jesus. Because where is our value found? Culturally, in that day, these women were finding value through the ability to have children. Culturally, today, we still see that in a lot of instances. But our value, our worth, is not found in the ability to bear children. It's in the fact that we are the children of God. We are made in His image. And especially as born-again believers, we have been adopted and born again into the kingdom of God. And so we seek him, we seek his will for us, even when it seems like our own wills and own desires sometimes go unfulfilled. We're trusting in him, having him guide us through those very, very difficult times. All right, so they're struggling with this. Verse 3. So she said, here's my maid Bilhah. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. And then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, his wife, and Jacob went into her. A surrogate marriage, very culturally acceptable. Again, does not mean this is biblically justified. This is another shortcut to circumvent God's plan, just as it had been with Sarah two generations earlier with Hagar doing exactly the same thing. Right? So one more parallel to mistakes that were made in the past. They're trying to do the same thing. Well, I know God promised many nations to come from Jacob. I've got to bear some, so I'll do it this way. Verse 5, then Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Rachel said, God has judged my case. He's also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. So Bilhah had the child. Rachel recognized this to be the work of God. Interestingly, though, she doesn't use God's covenant name. Don't know if we can really draw too many conclusions from that, but it is a contrast from the way Leah described her children. She uses just the, the normal name for God, Elohim. Right? The etymology of the name here comes from the Hebrew word to judge, uh, the yin to judge and so she believed herself vindicated she believed herself judged by the lord now having a child in her name at least verse seven and rachel was made bilhah conceived again and bore jacob a second son then rachel said with great wrestlings i have wrestled with my sister and indeed i have prevailed so she called his name naphtali May continues to conceive second son is named regarding this idea of wrestling uh, the Hebrew word actually refers to twisting, but in this grammatical form, wrestling. And um, basically, uh, Naphtali uh, would mean my wrestling here. But notice with whom she's wrestling. It's her sister. She's fighting her sister, her sibling. This has become a sad competition. They're using their children as bait, right? Rachel now believes she's got the upper hand because it was her maid that bore the, the most recent children. Uh, this just leads to nothing but trouble. Well, Leah does the same thing. Verse 9, Leah saw that she had stopped bearing. She took Zilpah, her maid, gave her to Jacob, his wife. She takes his cue from her younger sister. 
You know, by this point, Jacob basically has four wives and six sons. His house is growing rapidly. Verse 10, and Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. Now, translations vary regarding Gad. It could either refer to a troop, it could refer to good fortune. On the one hand, having another son from the influence in, in the name of Leah is kind of like receiving reinforcements in battle, right? Troops coming along, uh, helping me out here. On the other hand, this was good fortune for Leah because she had personally stopped bearing by this point. Verse 12, then Leah's made Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Leah said, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Now, happy and blessed had actually come from the exact same root word, Asher. Ashar. And so it's, it's to be considered fortunate. Uh, you know, uh, the second son of Zilpah was named after Ashar, Asher, the happy one, blessed one. Now, whether Leah viewed her blessedness as being from the Lord or she just thought, now I can be happy because I've got a good reputation among the, the, the daughters around, <laughs> even my husband doesn't look at me this way, that's unknown. Hopefully, we attribute our blessings to the Lord. We're seeing it as a gift of His grace. Now, we're going to get a little break from the childbearing narrative, but the next episode plays a pretty key part in it. Look at verse 14. Now, Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field, and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, Is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? What's a mandrake? What exactly the plant was, we don't know. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, associated it with what we know as the mandrake plant. Now that's possible. But the Hebrew word is used only once in the Old Testament outside this context. That's in the Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 13, if you're interested. The plant was viewed basically as an aphrodisiac. And the plant we know as a mandrake would definitely fit it. It's a hallucinogenic, potentially very, very dangerous, but people in different cultures have used this for hallucinogenic drug purposes. This is basic superstition at work. Right? This is another one of Rachel's shortcuts around her infertility. She wants the mandrake because she believes the mandrake might do something to her to make her be able to bear children. That's why she's so desperate to take it away from Leah. Can't have her having any more children. I need to have the children. Get me the mandrake for me. And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came out in the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come into me, for I surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. So they're prostituting their husband. This is how bad things have gotten. you got to wonder what Jacob thought about all this. He's become a pawn. He's giving no leadership to his family. you got to wonder what kind of example this set for their children in all this. They're seeing this modeled among their parents. The, the New English Translation Study Bible makes a great note here. It says, The irony is that Rachel thought the mandrakes would work for her, and she was willing to trade one night for them. But in that one night, Leah became pregnant. The mandrakes did nothing for Rachel. Why? Because it wasn't God's time for Rachel yet. Again, shortcuts around God's plan don't work. Verse 17, And God listened to Leah, and she also conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband." So she called his name Issachar. Now remember, she had previously stopped bearing. God allowed her to start again. God listened to Leah. Not that he had you know, stopped his ears, but he heard her prayers. He showed her grace. Now, unfortunately, Leah seems not to have seen this as grace, but as a wage. Wages, by the way, in Hebrew, sakar. Sakar, higher wages, reward, which is where we get Issachar from. Not a direct grammatical tie, but it was you know, sound play, word play. Leah conceived again, verse 16, bore Jacob a sixth son. Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. She called his name Zebulun. Now remember, she had had a great perspective with the birth of Judah, her fourth son. I'm just going to praise the Lord. It seems like that perspective is lost by this point. She's back at the point of believing that her husband would value her based off the children she bore for him. And like Issachar, this one is viewed as a type of reward or payment. 
uh, the word zebud is a gift or an endowment. And so you've got a similar sounding word, uh, um, zabar, zavar, which refers to exaltation or honor. So when you've got zebulun, it kind of puts those two ideas together, right? A gift that's exalting her in the eyes of her husband. She's not looking to God anymore to pray. She's just looking to be valuable. Where are true riches found? In Christ Jesus. Where does our eyes need to be on? Christ Jesus. Our trust needs to be in Christ Jesus. A little note here in verse 21. Afterwards, she bore a daughter, called her name Dinah. Almost included as an afterthought, but it's very important for later on. Daughters are rarely mentioned in genealogies. And it's quite possible that, you know, by this point, Jacob had far more children than just the ten sons listed. But Dinah becomes a central character later on. We'll get to her in several chapters. Interestingly, her name is the feminine form of Dan. And so why they chose the same name, we, we don't know. Verse 22, Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. So finally, after all this time, Rachel is blessed to bear a son. God remembered Rachel. That's not a statement that he had forgotten her. Just God had his own timeline for her. Now it was time for this to be fulfilled. So like Sarah before her, like Rebecca before her, Rachel was not able to bear children until God allowed her to bear children. And like the generations before her, that child she bore would indeed be special. And he was, right? Not only was Joseph soon to become the favorite of his father Jacob, but he was the one through whom the entire clan would be miraculously preserved from the famine in Egypt. Very special son. And so Rachel's response is, God has taken away my reproach. God has removed my disgrace from me. She had been disgraced in the eyes of her culture, it seemed to be, disgraced in the eyes of her older sister. But now God had rolled all that back away. Why? Because of a gift of grace, he gave her a son. God removes our disgrace. God removes our reproach. It's always an act of his grace. Nothing we do to deserve it. Now, was Rachel satisfied with her son? Not really. Already she's looking forward to the future. What does she say? The Lord will add to me another son. In fact, she names her child, the current child, the one she just bore. She named him after that hope of another son. Joseph literally means he adds. He adds. Yasaf, add. Joseph, he adds. Now, was this faith? Maybe. Was this prophecy? Maybe, because she would bear another child. Definitely true. God did add to Rachel another son, but that son would literally be her death. She died in childbirth and bitters her at the end. But it was grace that she had Joseph at all. Now, where should have Rachel's satisfaction been all along? Should have been in the Lord God. Same thing with Leah. It should have been in the Lord God. Same thing with Jacob. Should have been in the Lord God. It wasn't. Not yet. A lot of childbirth. Usually have so much joy associated with weddings and childbirth. Here, there's a lot of division a lot of heartache in the family of Jacob. Jacob couldn't get married without getting swindled by his father-in-law. And once married, because of his lack of love, his fault, his wives, the sisters, they start this tragic competition, again, using their babies as bait, as ammo in their war against one another. So you've got division, deception, devious plans of men and women as the order of the day. But in it, please do not miss God's sovereignty. God shows himself sovereign even over the worst of their sin. If Jacob had received what he initially desired, he would have ended up with one wife, many years of barrenness, and one child, neither of whom would have led to the fulfillment of God's covenant promises. Where would be the nation? Where would be any people to inherit the land? From where would come the Messiah and the rest of the world? Joseph was not that line. There is no doubt that Laban sinned against Jacob. There's no doubt that Jacob sinned against Leah and that Leah and Rebekah sinned against each other. But out of all of that sin, God brought forth the foundation of the nation of Israel. Out of all that sin, God brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Guys, our God is so sovereign, he can turn our sins into blessings. As Joseph would later observe regarding his brothers, what man means for evil, God means for good. Genesis 50, verse 20. 
And that said, we don't sin in order that we might see God's sovereignty. He's going to work His will no matter what. But depending on how we're submitted to Him, we might experience some pretty painful lessons along the way. There was a lot of heartache endured by Rachel and Leah and Jacob that could have been avoided. Probably a lot of heartache with Bilhah and Zilpah as well, though they don't get much attention. A lot of heartache among kids probably as well. God would spare us from that pain. How does he do so? Through our humility. So we want to stop fighting against one another. We want to stop trying to force our own will. We want to humble ourselves under the hand of God and see what it is he does. Because he does amazing, miraculous things. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. And thank you for working it the way you did to bring Jesus about in the first place. We wouldn't have him at all if it were not for your incredible sovereign plan, your miraculous hand, your love and your grace toward us. Thank you, Lord, for loving the unlovables like us. Thank you for uh, working our shortcuts and our things turning those into your greater glory. And I would pray, Father, that we would submit ourselves to you at the first instead of waiting until the latter. Help us avoid the painful lessons that were along the way. Help us sow good things for your glory rather than evil things. Fill us with your spirit and guide us in such a way. And help us show grace to those who have come against us. Lord, we thank you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.